So on this video today, I want to look at spin, deflection, and narrative. And we're just going to go through Mary Barra's most recent interview, and I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, the most powerful female CEO in America, and if I can go so far to say one of the most influential in history. Um... Hold on to that. Most powerful, most influential. Hold on to that. And her willingness to engage, and because she's in the middle of some of the biggest, thorniest issues every single moment, it feels like. And right now she is dealing, of course, with tariffs, with global trade, the EV debate, the Oval Office, and so on. There's your narrative, the EV debate. What is the debate? We are in this moment now where it appears uh, as if the EV revolution in America is coming to a standstill or maybe moving backwards. Is that what's happening? It's more narrative building, more narrative building. And by the way, later this afternoon, I don't know if you can speak to it, uh, but the president is supposed to uh, announce uh, a weakening effectively of some of the restrictions on fuel efficiency, which should make it easier for you to make more, uh, you know, gas guzzling cars. Well, first of all, I would say every new vehicle that we come out, every engine we invest in from an internal combustion, we work to have you know, significant improvement from a fuel economy perspective, from an emissions perspective. So we're going to continue to do that. 2035 is a long way away. It's a decade. And when I look back of how much has changed in the last five years, uh, one thing I've learned after being in this, in this position for 12 years, I'm not going to make a lot of predictions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is transforming. I do believe, fundamentally, EVs have better performance. She's not going to make a lot of predictions. And yet she's one of the most powerful people on Earth. Is that because she's clairvoyant or because she's more powerful than any prediction she could make? She can change it on a whim. I do want you to hold on to what she just said right there. EVs are more powerful. Listen again. I do believe fundamentally EVs have better performance once, but there's work that needs to be done. We still need to get better battery technology and we're innovating with LMR technology with our partner, LG Energy Solutions. I don't know if that's a spin or a narrative, but LMR technology, I don't know if it's the bleeding edge or the cutting edge of battery technology. Let me know your thoughts technology we're working on that will start to roll out in just two years will take up to ten thousand dollars off the off the cost of an ev so when i look at what's happening ten thousand dollars off the cost of an ev can come in many ways including the lfp batteries they're buying from someone else for the bolt and is that ten thousand dollars for me or ten thousand dollars for gm with innovation and battery technology, what's happening across the country and across the globe from a charging perspective, I think it's hard to say exactly where we'll be in 2035. But what I can tell you is we're going to be guided by the consumer. Well, but let's, let me ask about that, though, because clearly she says guided by the consumer. Now, listen to what my interviewer says. I think you would argue a mistake has been made. Not by just yourself, by the way, Ford, everybody who's been in the American industry trying to build EVs who's announced a loss, $1.6 billion charge for you, obviously Ford, a $1.9 billion charge. This is more narrative building. Research and development, it is nothing more than a spend. It is a cash burn. In fact, they have a name for it. It's called cash burn. And they won't say that with internal combustion. They just won't. In a perfect world, uh, you would have made what decision? What was the miss here? First of all, I think everyone who made those investments was making the investments based on the regulatory situation. Under the Biden administration, we were supposed to get to uh, 40 to 50 percent EVs by 2030. Right. We have a long cycle. If we weren't, if everyone and every single company, for the most part, was making those investments without them, we wouldn't have been able to sell an internal combustion engine vehicle, have a robust portfolio of EVs at that point in time. So I don't think it, there was a mistake made by industry. I think we were doing what the regulatory environment was requiring us to do. OK, but, but one of the things that was happening. She's talking about the regulatory environment like she doesn't influence it. Like GM didn't write entire sections of the big, beautiful bill. Happening during this period of time, and it's just happened. This spring, Congress passed a law that stripped California of its right to set emission standards. Um, that mandate would have effectively required car companies to sell only EVs by 2035. But you lobbied for that. Well, I would say several OEMs lobbied for a... And as I have since I've been in this role for one national standard. This is the spin, and I could argue it's also deflection. There is no way that Mary Barra can honestly admit that she didn't advocate for the abolition of CARB. She got exactly what she wanted when CARB was no longer able to be enforced. One national standard is just 
throughout this interview over and over again. When we're starting to follow different standards by state, it makes it very inefficient. So if we want to put the best product on the road as efficiently as possible, we need right. one national standard. When you look at where uh, the regulatory environment for the states that follow CARB was, Model year 26, and as you well know, model year 26 starts in calendar year 25. Those states needed to be at 35% EV adoption, which meant for us, for every three cars I ship to the state, one of them has to be an EV, and I can't ship another one until that one is sold. The state of New York, where we sit today, they were, they were at 7%. So do you think in a model year change, it's going to be five times more demand for EVs? We were going to have to start shutting down plants. They shut down a bunch of plants anyway. They were just EV plants instead. And sell those vehicles. So again, I looked at where's the consumer? And, and the consumer, you know, when you think about buying a new vehicle, for right. most people, it's one of the most in, in, uh, expensive uh, purchases they make. They're very rational about it. That is just complete and total deflection. It's an emotional decision almost every time. If you're talking about new cars especially. To know this vehicle is going to be there day in and day out. If all of a sudden they've got to drive to college and pick up their child or drive cross country to take care of a parent, they need to know that they don't want to have to worry about what I'm going to, how I'm going to get there. So I look at the... No, I think that's narrative building. That's her saying you have to go buy one of our ICE cars because you can't get there. We're building infrastructure, but you still can't get there. Consumer and say we have to be led by the consumer, but that doesn't mean we can't continue to work on improving battery technology so we get the cost down, continue to work on putting uh, more EV infrastructure for charging to make people comfortable and give them that choice. Trump administration won. You lobbied with him effectively to get rid of this California emission standard? I, uh, we, as along with many other right. automakers, asked for one federal standard. No, and I, I... no, no, she wanted to abolish CARB. That's a lie. I, I would love to say that's a narrative or a spin or a deflection, but that is just a bold faced lie. You were, the, I believe, the biggest spender of lobbying money in Washington uh, after Meta. That's because I spend time talking to the administration so they know our, um, our policies. That's fair. You know. when, when she says talking to the administration, I think she means writing legislation. Let me know your thoughts. Where does that money go? If not directly into text and language of a law, where does that money go? Is, is the political view based or, or even the business strategy to some degree tied to the political wins. I think our business strategy... The business strategy is to own the politics. Don't get it confused. The entire goal is to make the government so weak that it has absolutely no say in anything. General Motors sells more vehicles in this country than anyone else. I want to maintain that, and so I have to respond to the policies of each administration. Uh, General Motors has been working with... as, as you. This is total deflection. She is trying to create and influence the policies of each administration. General Motors has been, you know, working with administrations for the last hundred years. This is very true. There's both of them admitting it. Working with administrations means we had our hand in the pie. We make the recipe. I'll give you the opportunity just to speak to this because he's going to be here later. And I don't know if he's going to comment on this or not, but he could. Gavin Newsom uh, said the following. He said, GM sold us out. Mary Barra sold us out. Andrew, I'm not going to talk about the rhetoric. Let's focus on results. We have the largest EV portfolio of anyone selling vehicles in this country. They do have the biggest EV portfolio other than Tesla. And as far as the number of options, yeah, they offer the most. Nobody can even compete with GM as far as the number of offerings in the EV market in the United States. But it's a low bar. China is now expected to hit 60% of sales this year, EVs. Germany, France, close to 20% growing in India, Africa, Latin America. And so the question, I think, is there a colossal mistake happening here? In five, ten years from now, um, are we destined to become a regional player in vehicles? I I don't think so. I mean, in in China uh, itself, yeah. This is just stutter, 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 spin, spin, spin. They invested in ICE engines instead of EVs, and they laid off 1,700 workers who are working on EVs. This is nothing but spin, spin, spin. She knows they're cooked. We're, you know, in uh, back in uh, Europe from an EV perspective. So I think we can be strong across the... Back in Europe. That's because you dumped all of your European companies. You owned a bunch of European companies and you sold them. Globe, uh, 
Uh, so I don't, I don't see that, uh, you know, going to a regional player. My general philosophy, though, is I want to give customers choice. And so instead of telling them you must buy. Anytime you hear the word choice, you know they want no choice. Giving customers choice would be building 50% EVs and 50% ICE cars. That's choice. You don't want to give customers choice. We're going to invest in how do we keep making the vehicles better, taking cost out, charging infrastructure, so people have a choice. It's just more narrative and deflection. There's no choice. There was uh, both carrot and stick put right. in place from a regulatory perspective and an incentive perspective to drive that. There was both carrot and stick. GM is actively spending money to make both go away. And this guy dunks on her very soon regarding that. I think you don't like tariffs in certain ways, but then you like them in other ways. The tariff piece of this all has to do, uh, I mean, they're all intertwined in terms of whether the United States, in terms of our auto industry, ultimately is the most competitive in the world or it becomes a regional business effectively. All right, here's where she goes into the most ridiculous spin, deflection. I don't even know what to call it. It's bad. This, this right here is bad. There, were a, there was not a level playing field. Uh, I think there's been a lot done with tariffs to have a more level playing field. I wouldn't say it's level now, but for years we faced either tariffs or non-tariff trade barriers. I think getting to a, uh, a more level playing field is definitely better for all of the American OEMs. She says level playing field, but what she really means is completely blocking other automakers from making vehicles and selling them here. That's it. Complete and total blocks. And the tariffs do that and the regulations being rolled back make the ICE engines viable again. This is Elon Musk. He says, if there are no trade barriers established, they will pretty much, they being China, will pretty much demolish most other car companies in the world. They're extremely good. We, we all know that China is heavily subsidizing their industry. So I think that's what Elon was referring to. We were also heavily subsidizing our industry until the big beautiful bill which GM spent money to get in place. Those heavy subsidies, and it, I think it was like there's a government response right. there, there has to be a government response, or uh, that could happen. But what do you think is going to happen in all of these other markets in, in five or ten years from now if BYD is selling, uh, you know, advanced cars at cheaper prices than we can manufacture these things? It's over. That's what happens. It's over. And all they're trying to do is hold on. In this country, we've had lower incentives, either the lowest or, or among the lowest of incentives this whole year. The IRA had billions and billions of dollars of incentives built in. And have been able to sell our vehicles uh, based on the styling, the safety, the performance. The $7,500 tax credit. Think about the Equinox EV. Do you wish on just the EV front that, that the subsidy was still there? Do you think it was a mistake? take the subsidy away you know it's not my job to to opine on what regulatory environment yes it is it is her job to do exactly that to go meet with the government and influence them to take regulations away it absolutely is yes because then you lobby for other things so it is you i mean well, you have a position and, and the most important my position is what I, what i would like is consistency right. i want clarity whether it's terror incorrect you want absolute and total free for all no rules that's what you lobbied for and have gotten recently. You, there had been a big EV summit, if you remember, at the White House, uh, and he was not invited. And I asked you what you thought of that. I don't know if you remember, it kind of went viral. And you had said you hadn't thought a lot about it. In retrospect now, by the way, we had the Vice President of the United States here. Uh, she said it was a mistake uh, in her book recently. Do you think that that was a, a big mistake uh, by the White House in terms of how you were even dealing with, with that White House then? Well, when I answered the question last time, I, again, it wasn't something I gave a lot of thought to. I wasn't in charge of the guest list. Right. Uh, so, Just the guest list. I wasn't in charge of the guest list. I don't believe that for one minute. I believe pure influence, whether it be through the mighty dollar or whining and dining or opining or whatever other words she used, there was tons of influence. For someone at the beginning of the interview to say, you're one of the most influential people on earth at the beginning of the interview and then go into detail about how you've been invited back to this summit multiple times because of your influence and then to say, well, I don't have any influence there. Come on. Again, I, I try to focus on things right. I can control. No, I know, but influence. you know how Elon felt and then I, all of the things that happened in this country after that. I, I actually privately had that conversation with him. You did? I did. And you told him, what did you tell him? I, I told him that I, you know, he, cause he was crediting me. And I said, actually, I think a lot of that credit goes to Elon and Tesla. Wow. 
Um, I don't believe you. Since when does a CEO say, oh, no, no, I shouldn't be able to take credit for something. It was the, it was the other CEO. It was my competitor CEO. Autonomy. You know me, Andrew. I, don't, no. I won't want to take credit for things that I... I no, Come on. I, I want to ask you about autonomy because okay. Cruise um, was an early investment. I know a lot of the technology from Cruise is going to end up in a lot of your vehicles, but it's, it's not something that you're pursuing in the same way that you were before. Any t- transformative technology, and as we talk about artificial intelligence, a- autonomous driving is you know, one of the ultimate applications that I still strongly believe in. Uh, our investment in Cruise that we made in 2016, and remember at that time, we thought by 2019 we'd have autonomy. And frankly, we still don't have it yet where you can drive anywhere under any condition. Uh, so again, Oh, Cruise was a bomb that just exploded, and GM lost way more money on Cruise than they ever have on EVs. They don't mention the money from Cruise, if you notice. But what Cruise did do is create the Super Cruise Network. That was definitely a direct result of that. And the rest of this interview is about autonomy and other things. But these are just my takes on this Mary Barra interview. What are your thoughts here? She did, to her credit, at least take the hard questions But what do you think of our responses? Let me know your thoughts down below. Join Patreon or become a YouTube member for early access to videos and subscribe for more. We'll see you on the next one.